University of Toronto, three University of British Columbia, even a research scientist, teacher, and a consultant. And so all of his trips, even though they're wonderful adventures and he takes fabulous photographs, he also has a scientific eye. And so he brings to his, his presentations something about the culture and the people. Uh, so they're always incredibly entertaining and educational. And um, this one tonight is on the Pantanal, the wondrous wetland. The Pantanal in Brazil is the world's largest tropical wetland. And uh, David and Noreen uh, went there in part to look for the wonderful wildlife that is just unique to that region. Giant anteaters, and they are giant. Giant river otters, and they're giant. Uh, the tapir, they have marsh deer, and what did I miss? Jaguar. 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 That's right. <laughs> the big cat. The very elusive cat, but apparently now they're, they're not quite as elusive. Uh, at least the guides can find them. So anyway, I'll let David take you on a little journey here to a wondrous wetland. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thanks, David. Now I'm going to try and stand in one spot or approximately one spot. So those of you that can't see the screen might want to adjust your position if if necessary. The Pantanal is really a, an amazing place, and we've wanted to go there for quite a number of years. And um, back in 2019, we were on our way back from from um, Antarctica. Uh, we met a fellow at a lodge north in the Amazon, one of the tributaries of the Amazon, at Crystalina Lodge, and actually spent a week with him. And this fellow is a guide who does, and at that time was tracking jaguars in the Pantanal. So we've kept in touch with him and actually done other tours with him. And we had asked him what would be the best tour to go and see jaguars in the Pantanal, because that was the object of this particular trip. And this fellow, Diogo, um, was, he, he thought about it for a while. And then he said, the best one is with Cheeseman Ecological Tours or safaris, as they call it. So I'm going to see if we can get this working. Pantanal, you have to think about it as almost like a, a basin of water or a basin that can fill with water. And it has a little drain out the bottom, and that's the Paraguay River. And if there's a lot of rain, it fills the basin, and then the basin slowly drains. And so there's a, a progression of water down the course. And it starts, and I think any of you who read the, the the Audrey's newsletter will know that it started with close to a thousand. It's actually the number is over twelve hundred different streams of water flow into it from both the Andes and also from the Cerrado, which is the the higher land to the between the Atlantic and and the Pantanal area. So basically, all these rivers dump into this area, and when you have a wet season, that's a lot of water coming in. And then the, you come to the dry season, then the water gradually drains out and the whole area changes. This just came in last, well, I think two or three days ago. And it's it says new trip debut, but, but in fact, this trip is the trip we did. Um, they're not doing it in 2024 because they were unable to get any bookings in the lodges. The lodges were already filled up when they tried to do their bookings mm -hmm. for the year ahead. So now they're booking two years ahead in order to get uh, accommodation in some of these places. So the idea is to go see the big five in the Pantanal. And we had some arguments about what is big five, who knows, um, but I'll show you what we consider the big five. And it's an 18 day tour and um, we enjoyed every single one of those days and would have been happy to have more. Interesting thing about Cheeseman Ecological Safaris is they are carbon neutral and they claim to be, and I didn't check them out in that regard. And they also ask all their guests to contribute car or to buy carbon credits to offset their travel. The other thing they do is they support research in various places throughout around the world, actually, but 
but particularly in the Pantanal, there are at least three different projects that they fund on a regular basis. And part of what you pay in your tour fees go to the um, paying of these researchers who are studying various animals. So let's see if we can see some big five. So this is, I'll let you see it. It's just short and it's just giving you a peek at some of them. That was a mating pair of jaguars. This is a family of giant river otters. Can everybody hear me? If I speak up. And um, of course, there's marsh deer. This guy was cooling off on a hot day and um, not very active, but beautiful. And there was a, one in velvet just a, a little farther back in there. This is a tapir, and it was the only one we saw on the trip, and it was quite an amazing sighting because it's one that the Diogo did not know, so it was a, it's not one that he's ear tagged. We just happened upon it, and you could see it actually turn its, open its nose up so that it could sniff because it got a whiff of us and then took off. And then the giant anteater, and we had wanted to see a giant anteater and weren't sure whether we were going to see one and not come back to it. So that's the big five. Being a large wetland, as I, as I said, it's really huge. And these are the actual numbers, 42 million acres. Um, that's sizable. But 95% of it is private land, either in ranches or they call them fazendas, which are really... Um, plantations, so it might be a coffee plantation, not in this particular area, but, but plantations of various things. And some of them are actually set up as ecotourism areas. Lots of plants and animals, some of which aren't seen in other places. And that's because of the unique nature of this particular habitat. So we flew from Vancouver to Mexico City, and then Mexico City on down to Sao Paulo, Brazil. Now, previous time we went to Sao Paulo and into the Amazon basin, we flew to Toronto and back. And if you think about Toronto, flying to Toronto and then down to Brazil, it's two sides of a triangle. The, the Miami look, or the uh, Mexico City flight looked more direct. And in many ways, it was, it was very direct and, and convenient. Although, what was it, the, the, the 737 MAX that we flew on? the most uncomfortable seats on a plane I have ever been on, going down to Mexico City. So we we spent two nights in Sao Paulo, and that was basically, we knew we'd be early mornings, and you're, I think, in, in the Pantanal area, about three hours ahead of us, and... Um, so a, a couple of day recovery from a travel is a good idea. Everybody been at the airport and and we flew to Cuiaba, which is the capital of Mato Grosso province in Brazil and just to the north of the Pantanal area itself. Now, this is an um, interesting bit of information. Although the Pantanal floods, a lot of it doesn't flood very deep, but you'll find patches of vegetation like small forest patches that are just slightly elevated. And sometimes that's just enough to get the trees to grow. If there's too much water, the roots, um, essentially the trees will not, uh, will not grow. This particular one is showing some of these um, large lily pads. So January is the wettest, June is the driest, and you have a seasonal fluctuation in the rainfall. And with it, you get this um, flooding and then draining of the Pantanal Basin. This is some data from 2019 and 2020. And you'll notice in 2019, there was the gray bars are the monthly rainfall um, averages. The blue bars are what actually happened in 2019. And what, what happens when it floods? You all, all know, when it doesn't flood, you get this, huge fires. And the consequence of those fires is devastation in some areas. 
And in the northern Pantanal, it is particularly bad because the trees are not used to fire, whereas in the southern Pantanal, where this is from, it's used to fires and the vegetation comes back. But in the northern Pantanal, that didn't happen. A lot of big trees gone for good, um, or they'll take years and years to develop. So that the, the environment that had been burned really changed because it became lianas and vines everywhere over these skeletal tree remains. Quite a change in, in the habitat. And of course, when these things are going on, 30% of the Pantanal burned. That's a massive amount of fire. And the, the estimate was 17 million vertebrates died. Now, there were lots that didn't die and were wounded or burned, if you call that wounded. And Osada, who you see in the lower right corner in this particular slide, um, is a cat that was burned, um, rescued, rehabilitated, and really rewilded or re released back into the wild, and is one of the cats that we actually saw. So they've had some success. Now um, they have a rearing program, one of the programs supported by Cheesemans um, of rewilding um, giant anteater young because they're roadkills. And when they're roadkills, they've got these young, what are they gonna do with them? And, and they try and get them back. At Cayman um, Lodge in the south of the Pantanal, they ran into real problems because they were unable to fight fires because of lack of water. And they're using uh, helicopters and bucket dumping and various things. But one of the real problems was in the dry season, when they have the fires, all these ponds have essentially dried up. At, at uh, Cayman Lodge, they recognized that this was something they're gonna have to do something about and they installed solar operated pumps in the, all of the appropriate places that they could and huge water tanks and they pump and, and keep these pockets of water open large enough that a helicopter can get in with a dipping bucket and fight. And uh, I just got a um, WhatsApp message from Diogo yesterday, I guess it was, and they've just spent uh, probably the last two months fighting fires and um, they got 90 millimeters of rain and he said they finally got a break. So this is the wet season for them and they needed the rain this year again. So the Paraguay River, which is the main drainage for this, or the only drainage really for the, for the Pantanal, has various areas and they must differ in terms of elevation or profile. And I looked and looked for a, a profile of the Pantanal and, and the river. And I probably could have plotted it from data, but I wasn't about to do that. I think it's quite clear that the water bottles up in one area and comes through essentially an orifice that restricts the flow. And that's what leads to this um, huge wetland. Now we were in um, early August and pink trumpet trees were in full bloom when we were there. Now, they only last for a week, and um, it's a week you want to be there because it's really uh, amazing for photography. But there are also yellow trumpet trees, and it depends on which area you are. And isn't it? And this photo shows yellow trumpet trees very plentiful in this particular area. And there are also some white trees, and Diogo didn't have an English name for them, but uh, they have a Brazilian name for that particular tree. The interesting thing about these trees is they drop all their leaves in the dry season and then they flower. And when they flower, of course, that's food for the birds and the animals. We saw monkeys, capuchin monkeys eating the blossoms of these trees and obviously a wonderful source of food. And it comes in plenty. And you see pictures like this particular one with the trees. This is in the Southern Pantanal going through an area an elevated road, and the reason the road is filled is to get it above the water level when it floods, and it didn't take very much to get high. It's the same as the forests. They need to keep um, a little higher. But in these puddles along the side of the river, the, um, the birds obviously have a huge advantage because as it's dried down from the water flooding everything, 
the fish are concentrated. And, and so you can very quickly see, see these birds catching fish. So there's probably a jabberoo or two here in, in this picture and some wood storks, um, probably some ibis and, and various other things, but I'm not gonna concentrate on that right at the moment. So this is our, ah, uh, good. So this is the route that we took, flew to Cueva, um, went to a Brazilian barbecue near the airport in Cueva at lunch, and then drove south, and we're driving south on the Trans um, Pantanera, which is um, a road built across the, the Pantanal. It was started by a president a number of years back, and they gave up because they couldn't do it. It was simply an impossible task, but the road goes part way as far as Port of Jar Joffrey. And when, at the entrance to the, the highway, most of these pictures were taken just very close to it. So you'll see there is grassland where there's elevation and then such, and you see the greater Rhea. Um, the picture in the upper center, um, in the upper center was taken farther down the road, but these are people standing in the, the uh, water hyacinths and, and fishing. And I sure wouldn't be doing that because in the water hyacinth and along the area are lots of yukari caiman. And these caiman can grow up to about 18 feet, I think. Um, they're crocodilians and they do eat large meaty objects. <laughs> so some of you may recognize the yellow-billed cardinal and the red-crested cardinal from being in Hawaii. Both those birds are introduced in Hawaii, but here they're resident. So we'll take a look at this highway, and this is the entrance and a little piece of video. So locals come and fish, some of them. Some of them stand in the water and fish, but as I said, it's not the kind of place where I would be keen to stand in the water and fish. Where the yellow dot is at the moment is a knot of payment. And these are good size caimans, and I think they'd be capable of chewing on your leg. <laughs> so, first stop was Arras, Arras Echo Lodge, and um, this particular picture, I just draw your attention to this little bump on the chair over here which happens to be a ferruginous pygmy owl. We were sitting down at breakfast and came in and landed on one of the chairs. And as people came, more people came. We were early to breakfast. Well, we're birders, so we get up early. A lot of the guests aren't birders, and so they're coming in a little later. And gradually the people accumulated and the bird moved off because I think he was getting a little pushed. So there's the ferruginous pygmy owl. The breakfast and lunch are served in this uh, thatched um, outdoor facility, and there's an indoor place where you have your dinners, which is in the upper left corner. Also, all around us were hyacinth macaws, and the hyacinth macaws, they have um, nesting boxes, and I'll show you some of that. So we spent two nights there, and if I spent time and showed you all the birds that we saw there, um, I'm going to run out, run out of time or run a little long anyway. So they have a, a tower, can, what they call canopy tower. And this is the group that we were traveling with. And Diogo is the fellow here marked with a yellow dot. So total of nine of us, and including the guide. And then we would have a driver if we were heading elsewhere. These are some of the of the uh, things that we saw in that area around the, the walks around the property. And um, I don't know, think I've ever seen a bat falcon in a tree. I've seen bat falcons way off in the distance as a little dot. You can tell from their profile what they are. Starry cracker butterfly and, and some other interesting birds, chestnut belly go on. This particular picture, we've seen the sun bittern in various places, I think in Costa Rica and in Panama, maybe also in, in northern Brazil. But 
we've never seen the inside of its wing. And people have always said, if you can catch that bird in flight, that would be great. Well, in this case, it held up a wing and Noreen captured this shot. So you can see one of the wings and get an idea of what this bird might look like in flight. Quite remarkable. Um, the red sickle bill or scythe bill in the bottom, absolutely amazing. These birds thing probe with their, their bill. The other thing was seeing two sun bitterns at once. That was a surprise. We have seen sun bittern on, on a nest in, in the Amazon, but, but that was um, only one. At this lodge, we had this, this truck that would take us out on the side roads. And a lot of the roads are actually elevated because it's otherwise it's wet. And so they're essentially like dikes, and you can travel these roads and look. And we we use this as the platform. Yogo has a thermal imager, and what he was able to do is scan and look for animals. And here's some of the things that we saw in the dark at night. Crab-eating foxes, lots of them. And you would see them, in this case, on the road. So they're fairly easy to photograph or in the bush along the sides. The ocelot was a great find and hard beast to get a picture of, but um, I actually got some eye shine there. And what it is is thermal imager. You identify the object. You can actually tell what it is. And then Dio goes and said, you ready? And you shine its flashlight, bang, and you take your picture. So these are all flashlight pictures. The um, birds in the nest, the yellow-faced parrots, and the Akari Arasaris in the, in the left corner here. Since there's three Arasaris here, I'm thinking that they're adult birds. Uh, it's possible that there's a young amongst them, but they all have full-size bills, it looks like. So are they grouping together at night to sleep? Most of the time you wouldn't know this, but when you see a glowing hole with your thermal imager, and then you start peering at it, you start to learn a little bit more about what's going on in the in the environment around you. Great image. So from there, after two nights, we headed south. And this we're back on the Transpantanar. And uh, these are a few things. Now down crossing the road in front of us, quite a ways off, was a yellow anaconda. And by the time we got close to it, it was pretty um, pretty far across the road, as you can see on the left. Noreen caught this picture through the windshield, I think it was, as, as we were approaching, probably six to seven feet long. And why'd the chicken cross the road? You can ask the same question, why'd the anaconda come out of the water, go across the dry road, because he knew there was water on the other side, I presume. Uh, the the um, pink trumpet tree in the center has a jabiru nest in it. And the Jabiru nest on the upper left here is one where it's very exposed. And when the nest is exposed, one of the adults stands as a sunshade for the chicks in the nest. And they trade, trade positions. One goes off to feed and the other comes back and becomes or replaces as, as a sunshade. So very interesting behavior. And then a marsh deer in the, in the lower right, southern screamers. Well, the Transpantanera eventually runs out, but it had broken the bridge. <laughs> so it more than ran out, it just plain stopped. But fortunately, the lodge that we were headed to or the hotel that we were headed to knew we were coming. They do have cell phone coverage and sent some little boats and some pickup trucks to pick us and our luggage up and take us the extra three kilometers down the road to where the lodge was. And this is the lodge, the Port of Port of Joffrey, um, Pantanal Nort, which um, used to be mainly a fishing camp and people go there to fish and there are lots of big fish in the river, but has gradually become more and more a place to go to see jaguars and it's, it can be used as a center. And I'm going to just give you a little bit of an idea of the place. We started our days fairly early. This is going to breakfast, alarm 445, breakfast 515, off on the boats at six before sunup. And this it's about a 40 minute run upriver to the park, which is a protected area for jaguars. And along the way, these are some of the things you see in this particular instance of floating lodge. And there are several of these 
you'll see them advertised. And in, in fact, if you're interested in going there, these are the kind of boats that using that's probably 115, 125 horse outboard on the back of them. So they can take a lot of people up and fast and get going. And they did. And this is what we're looking for. So in this particular instance, um, I think it's Marcella. She had two cubs and here's one of the cubs, but lost one probably to infanticide where an adult male will kill the, the cubs of a female to try and get her to go into estrus so he can mate with her. She managed to keep one cub and so she was still looking after this one. And uh, he's a curious little guy, but um, very secretive and the mom was pretty protective about it. But she was very tolerant of this because uh, as I'll show you in, in a second, there are lots of people around here watching them. And when you say lots of people, what do you mean by lots of people? Well, <laughs> I don't know why people talk in situations like this, but they did. Anyway, about 5.30, we'd head home at night. We'd go home for lunch and have a nap and a siesta, but then go out in the afternoon. And these are snail kites heading for their night roost. And there'd be thousands of them flying over you, headed to the same area. In the morning, you'd see them again going in the other direction. So this would be sunset about... 17.30 or 5.30 in the evening. So a long day, but then you went back, uh, had a shower, whatever, had a dining room and there'd be a bottle of, sometimes a bottle of gin on the table. You didn't pay for the gin, but you had to pay for the tonic. <laughs> They'd give you limes and ice, but <laughs> that's the first time I'd ever been in a place that uh, that's the way they dealt with drinks. Wow. I don't know. I don't know who ever paid for the gin, but it was all speared as a bottle on the table, and it wasn't our guide. That's for sure. So this is the first cat that we ran into, and, and it was just lying in the morning sun, coming up over the the edge of the bank. I guess warming up in the first part of the day. That's and not tripper. That's the same. Cat. That's the same cat. Three different shots. It didn't move up, so you had to take lots of pictures. In fact, the number of pictures was ridiculous, but. There were lots of other people taking pictures. So the number of electrons fired at, fired at this cat was <laughs> remarkable. Um, that cat is about an eight-year-old female. So this is some of the things that we saw, the Yukari caiman um, up to fairly large. This is a primary food source for these cats. Um, I can't talk about everything, but every picture has a story. That's the problem. I'll, I'll just tell you about the black skimmer. We've seen black skimmers in various places in Africa and South America. Always wanted to see them actually fishing, the way they fish with their lower bill in the water and going along. We did get to see them, and, and several of them, actually, and, and quite a few of them, but never did get to see them actually catch a fish. That would be the real thing, to capture that instant when they when they hit a fish and snap their bill and take off with it. This is a collection of the cats that we saw in, in the area of the Pantanal and, and the relationships between them. Basada in the upper left um, is a collared male and he's the one that was in the in the fire, burnt in the fire and then rehabilitated and re-released. Um, Ty was the first cat that we saw, about an eight-year-old female. And we saw her offspring, which was also an independent female at that, at that age. One unknown cat in the lower left. And Patricia, who was probably the matriarch in this group, um, we didn't get much of a picture of her because she had a huge caiman, probably as big as she was, as long as she was anyway. And she was hauling it into the bush and she was not gonna appear because she had food for probably several days. And Mendoza is the one that I showed you with a cub. And then this is the three-year-old, the three-month-old cub. And Marcella, I'll show you some footage of later on. This is Osada, um, the collared male with the injured eye. He got um, into a scrap the day we first saw him and it was still bloody. And um, he wondered how he was going to make out, and whether the eye was going to be actually damaged. But three days later, we saw him again, and um, the eye was looking pretty good. It looked like he, the, the wound was above the eye, and, and in fact, 
fully open and he was back to patrolling. So this is Marcella and part of the reason I'm gonna show you in this sequence and it goes on a little long, I'm gonna step back. Uh, is there's a couple of stories with it. This is about a two year old. So this will be her first real year of hunting on her own without a parent because they usually spend almost two years or close to two years with their mother before they become independent. And we followed her for two and a, two and a half hours at least as she worked the bank going down the river looking for Cayman, not successfully. Um, you always hope you'll see an opportunity. I, I've seen photographs of, of um, a jaguar jumping off a bank onto a huge Cayman and killing it. And how did the, the um, jaguars kill the Cayman? They bite right through the skull of the Cayman, kill it. In fact, that's how these jaguars kill their prey, is by crushing blow to the skull. They have the strongest jaw of any of the cats. I think that's what I read. So this is chasing a bird, racing down the beach. And Noreen was fortunate in that she was shooting stills. I was shooting video in this particular instance. And these are Noreen's stills of the cat coming towards you. And uh, just a few of the stills from that little sequence. And you get the, the motion, the action. Wow. Well, uh, oh, yeah. How hot is it getting there today? Um, probably high 70s. Day 10 temperature. Something like that. It wasn't super hot. There were days when it was hotter, depending on where you were, but along the water, it was not hot. We were happy in the morning to have a, something to get out of the wind. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the end of her run. Going back to patrolling the bank, looking for Cayman, all the water hyacinths, she pushed through them up on the bank, looking down into it. And, and uh, of course, as you go down river, what are you going to run into? Well, think about it. There are 20 boats, or it could be 20 or 24. I counted 24 max at one point. Just coming along, drifting along beside you as you fish, or as not fish, but as you're, as you're hunting. So you don't pay much attention to it. Um, do they interfere with their ability to hunt? I don't know, um, possibly, but there's gotta be something done about that. And I think people are talking about regulating the process of, of tourism because it's, it's really, wild cowboy country in there. But, but if you got a really good boat driver, and we did, and a good guide, they can plan on where the Jaguar is going to be next, and they'll be in the right spot when the right things happen. And that's where we were when that uh, Priscilla raced across that sandbank, because we were the only boat there. This is the reason she's getting a little hesitant, but she didn't stop. This is about one of those hotel, floating hotels. And there were people on the deck up above at the hotels, had great views, looking down on this whole operation. And these are the other boats because we scooted out and around. And I'll just give you a look back. You can see she comes out the other side, carries on down the bank. So it's, it's quite remarkable. This is a cat whose mother was reared during a time when there were boats around. And then she was reared at the time when their boats around. So these are acclimated animals and they continue to thrive. So um, this is some Victoria Amazonica um, lilies. And I, I don't know whether you people know the story about these. these lily pads can grow up to 10 feet diameter, really big ones. And what they do is, is they block the light and prevent other plants from growing up. So they really are dominant um, it's a predator in the, in the swamps and, and lakes. And um, they have really bristly um, spikes on the outside of these things pointing down all around them. So nobody wants to eat them and they just sit there and you see the birds walking across them and make some very interesting photography. So while we were waiting for lunch to be prepared, we, we walked out on this um, catwalk that goes out over top of the lake that's right behind 
the uh, Porter Joffrey um, Hotel. <clears throat> so this little plane came to pick us up. It's um, Cessna. And in Brazil, these are, are certified for carrying nine passengers. And there were nine of us. And then a pilot and a co-pilot. Um, they're capable of carrying a lot more than that. But they can, in Brazil, they're only certified for nine. And the reason is because Brazil makes um, Brera aircraft. And they have an aircraft that's very similar. Carries just a couple more people. So <laughs> anyway, <laughs> politics. Um, the pilots were telling us this story. So from Porto Joffrey, we got this charter flight and flew down to with the Diana. Got another van that was there waiting for us and then drove to Posada Agape. And so I'll take you to Posada Agape. But first I want to show you what we saw flying over the Pantanal. This is the areas that you see. You'll see these green areas. And unfortunately, um, it was cloudy where we took off in the northern Pantanal, and we didn't see the more forested areas. But uh, as we got closer to the southern Pantanal, which has more ranch land in it, um, cleared areas and, um, and vegetation, we were able to get these photographs. So um, the land where the trees are growing is slightly higher elevation. All the rest would be flooded during the, the wet season. In this particular picture, I think we see the impact of fire on this southern part of the Pantanal. And if, if you look at this and, and think about it, what's different between the road that runs through sort of north to south or top to bottom in this picture? And you'll see that there's very green, heavy vegetation, and then there's really sparse trees on the other side. And I think this is post-fire. It's like the fire burned out those areas. And they are coming back, but it's going to take them a long time to reach the density of forestry, forestation that is in the areas that weren't burned. So the fires have had a huge impact. So at Agape, <clears throat> this was an interesting place because there were two different lectures that we had at the point. And there are two different research projects that are supported by Cheesemans at, at this point. One is called the Peccary Project, in which they're studying white-lipped peccaries. And the other was on the um, anteater reintroduction program for injured anteaters. This is a plush crested jay in the lower left corner and sitting in front of some bougainvillea. You get those kind of pictures when you have feeders around. And the other thing is right in the middle here, you see a seven banded armadillo. You know, hard to see normally. This guy walked through under your table while you were eating. He was very... <laughs> used to the presence of people. He just totally ignored you. He was looking for the food that they were putting out to feed the birds. And in this particular picture, they're setting up a camera for the peccary project. And I'll explain a little bit of that later. Out in the back here, it says feeders. Well, the table takes you through to where you sit. And I'll give you an idea of, of what's going on where you sit. I'll show you some pictures of the feeder. So driving into this resort, we saw a giant anteater. This is our first giant anteater sighting. And here in Noreen's taking a picture. I took this with my phone as, as we were there. Before we got to the lodge, we had seen five, one of which had a young on its back. Unfortunately, the, the one with the young on its back was pretty uh, shy, and it kept dodging behind bushes, so it was really hard to get a picture of. I took this off the internet. That's a Flickr photo. But they were the, the young right on the back and to a fairly good size. And you know, the tongue on these, these giant anteaters is two feet long, it's a big sticky tongue. Okay, these are some of the guys at the feeder. Uh, this is Toko Toucan, the largest built bird. And uh, Nanandi parrots, parrots over here on the right. Now, He's putting on a show, this guy, and he tells you how dexterous he is with his bill and throws up things, catches them. And these are the people, some people still having their breakfast, I guess, late breakfast. We'd probably already done a walk. Okay, we'll do this. The peccary project is, is because the white lip peccary is very dependent on dense forest, on actual forest that has trees that are producing fruit and whatnot. The collared peccary, which is one you see in Arizona and various places like that, not quite the same. 
Uh, it's a little more tolerant around people. Okay, just to give you an idea, this young peccary is obviously very recently born. You can see his umbilicus still hanging down, almost hitting the, the dirt. There were two of them like that. So they could have been born in the overnight or very recently. And they pack along with the pack and move it. From there, we we went and we, two nights, and then we went to the Fazenda San Francisco, which is um, more a touristy place. It's it, and the truck on the on the lower left is the one we used to go around daytime and nighttime looking for various things. And um, these are some of the things that we saw and at, at um, the area. We actually got a good picture of a a reasonably good picture of an ocelot. Mm -hmm. And if you if you're interested in photography, that picture was taken in an ISO of 12,800, pitch black with a flashlight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Turned out not too badly, and that's using, using uh, topaz. <clears throat> and you'll see owls, the barn owl and the burrowing owl, both of which we see here. But I want to draw your attention to the solitary black cacique on the right. Caciques are a group of birds that are colonial and there's the yellow rumped and red rumped caciques and they tend to be colonial birds. And so you'll see a tree and it'll be just full of nests of these birds and there's a lot of chatter and, and squawking and whatnot. But solitary black caciques are that, they're solitary single birds. And they build their nests out of horsehair fungus. So they've got to collect fungus. And I think it'd be hard for a whole colony to collect enough horsehair fungus, even for one bird to collect enough to build one of these nests and weave it because these are woven nests. And, and the horsehair fungus is hydrophobic and it sheds water. Really amazing. Um, I'd never heard of a mojita, but there were three different species, I think, that we saw in that area. And of course, lots of hyacinth macaws. These are really remarkable birds. And, and uh, they say the way you can tell a male from a female is during breeding season, because the female is in the nest and the, more than the male and the tail gets curled. And so you'll see the tail curled on one of them and that's probably the female. Otherwise they look identical. And I took this photo for another reason, common putu. Not a, common bird to see, but at night and just stood on a post. But what it did is it reminded me to tell you a story. The Pantanal is, I think, fairly unique in the fact it is illegal to use barn, uh, barbed wire in fencing of the properties. If you want to fence your property, you fence it with bare wire and you drill holes through the posts to run the wire, you don't staple it. And the, the whole idea is then the anteaters can walk through, they don't get snagged, jaguars, any of these animals can go right through that. And you say, well, why don't the cows? Well, because they don't. And I guess they electrify it from time to time because it's in putting it together in this fashion, they can put an electric charge on it and, and um, control the cattle when they put the cattle into it and then the cattle will avoid it. So very interesting works and you, we've watched uh, jaguars going through this fence. They just, they don't even stop. They don't even hesitate and just walk right through it. Same with the anteaters. So this is the last lodge that we stayed at, which is Cayman Lodge. And I took this statement at the very top, a luxury ranch operating, um, pioneering ecotourism programs in the heart of the Southern Pantanal. If you look at their website, that's what it says. And it's, it's really true. It's um, a huge tract of property, privately owned. It used to be a race car driver, I think, that own, owns the property. And he loved to go to Africa and to see wild animals, particularly cats. And so he wanted to develop a, a system where you could do that in, in this area and established this whole program. There's three different lodges. We stayed at one of the private lodges. Um, I think we had three cooks, two cooks, two cooks and, and a bartender to look after the nine of us. Anyway, plus a driver. It was very nice. So um, they put out our meals for breakfast and lunch and dinner, except for the first night. And the first night we went elsewhere. Now, do you get audio in this? You know, like those little bars that they had where the peanut butter?
flavored ones. Yeah. That's what those smell like. Mm -hmm. If you like to eat meat, it's a great place. Yeah. But they have food for the vegetarians in the group as well. But a huge yeah. amount of meat. Sort of meat. <laughs> I don't know whether you've ever been to a Brazilian barbecue. They barbecue all this meat and spice them by the table with this, these poles with the meat on it and they slice it off. But you want rare or medium rare. And they slice it until it's all ready to fall off and you're given a pair of tongs to grab a piece of meat. Anyway, a lot of food. Beef. Of course, beef. This is this is Brazil. But they want all they also did chicken and sausage and and pork as well. Yeah. Anyway, they brought the, the musicians in from uh, it's probably an hour and a half drive to get there to the lodge and uh, brought in two musicians just for the group of us. Okay, um, this fellow who owns this huge tract of land uh, developed essentially this business of ecotourism. And their first step was to bring trackers from Africa and train trackers in the Pantanal to track uh, in this case, jaguars. The trackers they brought from Africa were used to tracking lions and tiger, or lions and leopards and various things. So, over a period of about five years, our friend Diego worked as a tracker on that program to learn where the jaguars were, where they spent their time, and to get them used to people. And now, in the early days, they'd get probably. 85% of their guests would get to see a jaguar. Last three years, it's been 100%. They don't like to say it's 100%. I think they quote about 95 or something like that. But essentially, we saw one every day. So I would say there's a good chance if you spend a few days there, you're going to see jaguars. So Anka uh, Fari is the name of the organization. And its main goal is to track. And I, I first look at this little track right in the middle here down near the bottom that's a track in the sand along the road that Diogo picked up as we were driving along and he says whoa stop and it's a track of a maned wolf that's as close as we got to a maned wolf they are pretty skittish and they're trying to improve the ability of people to actually get a chance to see them but um, that one was in a this was this is a picture taken in a museum of a stuffed animals. So I did not get a picture of Maine Wolf. That was, I did a little bit of Photoshop on it so you can't see the reflections, but basically that's as close as we got to, that track was as close as we got. So the Ankhfari group is involved in ecotourism, science, and they have some programs where they're looking at the aging and the breeding and the interrelationships between all these these um, cats and now the maned wolf. And also they're doing a project on the tapir and that's the one that our friend is in charge of. They're tagging tapir and, and tracking them with uh, radio tag, ear tags. Um, education, they go to the schools and do various um, education programs and they also put stuff up on the internet. And they also rewild animals that are orphaned. And um, they have a social program where they interact with the locals and they look after the forest. So they fight forest fires and things like that. So Ankhfar is an important organization and it has allowed this to develop. And I'll tell you a little bit more about it. First, um, Diogo took us to where his, his tapir trap. And the interesting thing about visiting the tapir trap is it's a mineral lake. And the mineral lick is, of course, where the peccaries come to and, and the tapir and various other animals. I think every one of us picked up ticks. <laughs> but we were warned and walked far. But when we came out of the bush there, the driver of the vehicle, he was picking ticks off. They were the size of grains of salt. Anyway, uh, I only brought one home, I think. <laughs> So you should have some audio of a red leg Suriyama squawking. As it gets towards dusk, these birds start calling and calling. This bird is about almost three feet tall, 30 inches, I think it's, it's, it's fairly, and very loud. And they make themselves heard. And he was standing by the road when we went by. 
think so. It's more like a secretary bird. So I think it probably preys on things on the ground and yeah. it spends the most time. There. When they started this program, Akfari started the program, they asked all the local farmers what the impact of the jaguars was on their herds. And they said, oh, they kill all our, our game. You know, just about every, every, um, every calf we lose or every cow we lose, the jaguars kill them. And so they did a thorough investigation of all the kills for a period of time. And they discovered that about 3% of the herd is lost to natural causes. And the jaguars are responsible for some predation, particularly where there are lots of them, and some of the smaller animals. <clears throat> so the deal is that if a farmer or a rancher in this area loses more than 3% of his cattle, they pay him and they compensate him for loss. And so they've got a very cooperative system with the farmers. The farmers know they're going to get paid if something happens. And there's all these tourism dollars and not coming in. Government pays them private lodges. No, the, the ecotourism lodge, the lodge that we say that actually pays them. They have a they have boundaries outside and, and they look within their boundary. Outside their boundaries, no. That's up to other people and governments to deal with. So um we saw this is a good sized cow, I would say full size cow, taken down by this Jaguar, the scene control. This photo also gives you an idea of the vehicles and the type of, of um, ecotourism that's run by the lodge. There were, I think a total of four of these Jeep like pickup trucks with, with um, rack um, seating accommodations on them. And um, not a lot of them. And I think the most we saw to kill was four, us plus three others. So this is Surya, um, a collared female who has a young one, Juba, a one-year-old, with her. And it was fun watching Juba playing with the carcass, basically, and uh, investigating and nibbling little bits. Mom was just stuffed and just lying flaked out nearby. And he'd eventually wander off, and the the um, black vultures would come in, and as there are more and more black vultures, he'd get mad, and he'd go racing out after them and scare all the vultures. Anyway, this went on for quite a period of time. Interesting about this particular photo is I never really thought much about how um, animals are consumed by predators. But the jaguar starts at the neck and throat and works down. Most of the African kills that I've seen start at the back end and work forward. Interesting. But the jaguar actually kills by crushing the skull. That's how it starts. And uh, usually you know, it's on its back and, and just closes those jaws and crushes it. So <clears throat> this is probably the last sequence. Um, Jafar and Farah is, Fara is a female, Jafar a male, and they were mating, have a mating session. Now, you, I don't know whether you know that the jaguars can go on for days and up to a hundred times a day, you'll, you'll see, apparently they'll be mating. We didn't see a hundred events, but <laughs> we spent the morning following them. Voyeurs, I guess you'd call us. And they were quite, chummy at times, and then you'd occasionally get a flare up and you'd get these real snarly battles. And uh, anyway, very interesting to be able to actually observe that from probably as far away as that wall. I mean, you know, 20, 30 feet away. These are not zoomed pictures. These are, you can take them with your phone. So we saw 225 bird species, 84 were lifers. Um, 16 different jaguars, but jaguar sightings were probably, what, 40? Because we would see them again and again on different days. But because each jaguar has a unique pattern, you can identify each individual beast. Their, their uh, fur patterns are unique. And that's why they had names, because they know the patterns of them. And there's actually a book, or I think 
Diogo did it on the internet. He'd look at it and he'd say, oh, that's so-and-so. See this spot and circle. I don't know whether you know that jaguars have these rondelles, I guess, round, roundish spots, and they have black dots in the middle of them, whereas I think it's the, the cheetah does not have the dots in the middle, but they have the same general shape. So these are the, the beasts and their behaviors and whatnot that we were very fortunate to experience. So I think I'll leave you there. Slide, Steve, if you had.